She is a Johnson County EMG. Uh, she's been a master gardener for a very long time, originally in Chicago, where she did volunteer work at the Botanic Gardens. And if you've not seen them, it's worth a trip. She's going to talk to us today about small space gardening. And Merle, I'm going to turn it over to you now, and I will okay. be quiet. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, she said confidently. There we go. Um, okay, um, I was a landscape designer as a midlife career. Um, so my practice did involve mostly small space type gardening. I called this from the ground up, but actually I think of it as messing with your mind. Um, I didn't come to landscape design as a horticulturist or an artistic type came to it from a background in perceptual psychology and uh, as an undergrad and you know, more of the social sciences. So I take a slightly different perspective in this presentation is going to focus more on some tips and techniques and some ways to make your small space not only work better, but look bigger. Um, so let's get, oops, uh, and now, I can't get it to move uh, for some reason. Let me see. Oh, there we go. Um, so no matter what your space, um, the design process is always the same, whether you're designing a container or a couple of acres. You wanna define your objectives, um, identify your problems, measure the space you've got, sun and shade patterns, Evaluate what you have, what's worth keeping, what you really should get rid of. Please don't be one of those people who says, well, it's still got three green leaves at the top. It's still alive. Um, it's called ornamental horticulture for a reason. And if it's no longer ornamental, you may want to consider getting rid of it. Um, you determine your style and then in red letters, make a plan. And that's the part that I always tend to gloss over. Um, when these, I'm doing these presentations. Um, so we're gonna focus on what goes into a plan. Um, and notice that we don't even begin to talk about plant material until we're uh, well into the process. So what goes into design? A design has to function. If you turn it all into flower beds and your kids have no place to throw a football around, it's not going to function. Um, good design repeats an element um, to make it a unified whole. It could be a plant, it could be a color. Um, you just want to have a, some repetition within the garden. That doesn't mean you buy two flats of, a, of impatience and put them out in a pink, white, pink, white, stripey manner. Uh, it just means you want to have something that ties everything together. In a small space, you wanna have a cohesive color scheme. You just don't have room to go hog wild with color. Um, and there will be a rant about color choices later. Um, all good design involves a variety of form and texture and you wanna plan for all seasons, particularly in a small space garden where you're going to be up close with it all year long. Um, so what's a small space garden? Well, it depends where you are. If you've moved from uh, five acres out in the country to a half acre closer to town, that's gonna seem like a very small garden. But if you're coming from a townhouse to that half acre, that's gonna seem pretty big and intimidating. Where you are will affect your perception of not only the size of the garden, but what it should actually be and look like. And of course, every property has a small space somewhere, a side yard behind the garage, you know, that kind of space. So this was one of my first clients. Um, and instead of a house, you kind of expect to see the witch's cottage back behind all those big tall trees. Um, so suburban lot, you know, older suburb, take a look at this property and you say, 
the trees have had their day. It's time to take them out, put in something that's more proportionate to the house, um, allows more sunlight into the house, that sort of thing. But if your small space is a little cabin in the woods by the lake, you don't want to start taking out trees. Um, so how do you approach that? I mean, you bought the property for its woods. Um, and the answer here is to do some underplanting, which will bring everything back into scale and proportion and will avoid the look of, I'm living in a telephone pole factory. So scale and proportion gets very critical in a small space garden. And this is where we have to get technical for a while. Um, give me a moment while I take a sip of water. Um, if you've studied art or architecture or philosophy or ancient Greece, um, you may have heard of the golden mean or the golden ratio. It's um, a major concept in design work thought up by the ancient Greeks, uh, signified by the um, small case phi. Um, and it is a mathematical ratio of one to 1 1.618. What does that mean? It's a perfectly symmetrical relationship between two proportions. If you're looking at the row of numbers on the bottom of the screen, um, you may be having flashbacks to the SAT. Um, it's called a Fibonacci sequence of numbers. And we'll look at that on the right in a minute. So if you have a rectangle and you divide it in two, according to the golden ratio, you have uh, the large square on the left and a smaller rectangle on the right. And if you divide the smaller rectangle, so on and so forth. And if you draw an arc through each of those rectangles, you end up with what is called the golden spiral. Whole lot of design and numerical talk, and what does it all mean, and why do we care, and what does this have to do with gardening? It has to do with the fact that the Greeks recognized something inherent in nature. It is all around us. This proportion, this spiral, is in our galaxy, our hurricanes, our sea life, our plant life, our future plant life. Um, it's something that we as human beings innately respond to. The Parthenon was built according to the golden ratio. It's a reason we're still in love with it today. It's something deeply satisfying. Um, but what does it mean when you're drawing a landscape plan? Well, you use it to determine how big, how far, how tall, how wide. Say you have a low slung ranch house and you wanna put a tree at the corner of the foundation planning. How tall should that tree be aesthetically? Well, if you look at the golden ratio or the golden mean rather, um, say the house is 12 feet tall then applying the golden ratio, uh, one and two thirds of 12 feet would be about 20 feet. So a 20 foot tall tree would be in perfect proportion to your house. Also that works for distance. How far out should you plant it from a structure? You can do the same thing. Now, realistically, because plants are not mathematical entities, uh, and we have no control over their eventual size and shape. Instead of trying to work out this 1.618, as a rule of thumb, if you keep in mind that a ratio of one to one and two thirds gives you a reasonable way to space your plants or figure out heights or draw your plan. Sometimes you can be very literal. Um, this was one I saw online that did the curve exactly in a golden spiral. 
This one took the golden spiral and just flipped the curves, the arcs, when designing their curving beds. And this one is one and two thirds on the heights of the various plants, except for the row at the bottom, which is a little short. So now we're gonna do some smoke and mirrors, um, talk about trips, tricks that make your landscape look bigger uh, and more extensive than it actually is. Forced perspective is one of the big tricks in landscape design and nobody does it better than Disney World. So here we are with Snow White, or seven dwarfs and a few cheerful little creatures. And Snow White is way up high. We know Snow White is a human. So our brain goes, Snow White is farther away because she looks smaller, but we know she's not smaller. And this whole area from the bottom to the top, the depth of it is really only about eight feet. But our brain sees this as much further away because there's a small figure. And Snow White is actually the exact same height as the dwarfs. But we've tricked our brain into thinking she's much further away. And what does that mean in a garden? Well, if you have the end of a path or some beds that you want to emphasize and you thought, well, a container would be nice. Instead of setting the container on the ground, if you elevate it, it brings your eye up, your eye thinks it's further away and it also carries beyond the fence to what's beyond, giving you the optical illusion that it's a much further distance than what it actually is. Because we see with our eyes, but we, we look with our eyes, but we see with our brain. And our brain is amenable to being fooled. Um, here's another view at Disneyland. Um, the castle looks like it's quite a distance away and the crowds are getting thicker and thicker. Oh, more excitement, bigger. Actually, all these three-story buildings are only two stories. Um, the castle is not that far away. What Disney has done is he's slowly, they've slowly narrowed the street, forcing you to concentrate on the castle and making it appear that it's further away and the crowds are bigger and bigger. What does that mean in the garden? Well, if you narrow a perspective, it creates a feeling of distance. This is um, Dunbarton Oaks in Georgetown in Washington, DC, very famous garden. Um, and this over here seems very far away when in reality it's not that far. And when you get there, an even further trick of forced perspective is the trellis which using narrowing of the structure gives it a feeling of depth. So you can use these sorts of trellises, these kinds of tricks in your garden, narrowing the bed to create a focal point that seems very far away. And here comes the mirrors part. Mirrors are a way to make a small space seem larger. And the one on the left, um, uses that forced perspective of narrowing. Um, that's not another room. That's not an open gate. That's simply an overlay of wood onto the mirror that gives the illusion that it's an open gateway. Um, if you're going to use mirror in a garden, um, you want to um, surround it with plants to um, give it more of an illusion of another garden and not just a another uh, mirror hung on a wall. Although sometimes you just want to be blunt about it. Um, mirrors are a great way to bring light into what would otherwise be a very dark space. Um, the 
um, one on the upper right. It's a very large mirror which bounces light back into what would otherwise be a very dark space. Um, the ones on the right show how a, a case of incorporating mirrors almost as art to reflect light back up into a very dark space and give it some interest where you probably would have a difficult time growing much of anything. Now in the lower right, didn't even fool the cat, uh, but it uh, can be used to simulate a pond. Uh, the effect is a little more realistic if you use plants which kind of grow over um, and sort of blur the edges of the plant and put a little more reflection on it. Um, are there any questions of what we've covered so far? Um, I do have a question, uh, Merle, that's come in about the mirrors. Okay. And the, the question is, do the mirrors need to be designed for outdoor use? Is there differences in the way that mirrors are made and manufactured for outdoor uh, use? Yes, good question, and pardon my coughing. Um, yeah, I would recommend that you uh, get a mirror made out of polycarbonate rather than glass. Polycarbonate stands up better uh, to weather, um, so you can mount it for outdoors. I've used it in the Chicago area, and it stood up to uh, that climate very well. Um, and most mirror shops will be able to provide you with polycarbonate mirror rather than glass mirror. Okay. And then another, uh, another question has just come in also about um, suggestions for protecting mirrors from breakage and um, discoloration or staining. I think, uh, you know, eventually the mirrors will discolor a bit. That's kind of part of the charm. And mirrors uh, become, uh, you know, most mirrors do age um, and it's a look, but you may have to replace the glass from time to time. It just sort of depends on the exposure um, and whether you do have a mirror as a permanent fixture or something you can bring in. Um, but is it gonna be there forever? Probably not, but I think, you know, a, a polycarbonate mirror should last a good 10 years or so before it uh, needs replacing. Okay, thank you for that. And um, I'd like to remind participants or ask participants to, if you do have questions uh, while Merle is presenting, please enter those in the chat box and we'll take breaks from time to time like this to answer um, and address those questions. Yeah, um, so my apologies. Box. I know you had asked me to uh, make people aware of that, but. Okay, yeah, no worries. Mm -hmm. That's all the questions we have for now, Merle. Okay, um, now I'm going to go off on a small rant about color. Um, every 10 or 15 years, um, there is a trend in landscape design. It's, uh, you'll hear every color goes with every other color. Don't worry about it. You can mix colors together and Thousands of doctoral dissertations on color perception go up in smoke every time that happens. Um, it's not true that every color works with every other color. And I say this from the perceptual psych point of view. Um, my rule of thumb is if you wouldn't put them together in your living room or on your clothes, maybe you wanna rethink if you're going to do it in a garden, uh, particularly in a small garden. And I found this, which kind of encapsulates my point of view. These aren't my words, but I think gardens should be harmonious spaces, pleasing to the eye. And if it's not harmonious, it can be boring, it can be chaotic. We don't, our brains like things which are easily organized, but they also like to be stimulated. So. If it's something we've seen over and over, it goes, don't have to pay attention to that. If it's something that's too jumbled, we just kind of go, let's move on. So what color harmony does, it delivers visual interest and a sense of order. 
and some basic color principles that you can use in a small space. Light colors come forward, dark colors recede. If you think of a shade garden, the white impatience show up much brighter than the red impatience next to them. Um, the light colors will always draw the eye. So if you use a progression of colors from light to dark in a bed, it will create a feeling of movement or distance and we have the psychology of cool colors are perceived as calming, warm colors as energizing. So if you're doing something where you want a more meditative look in your garden, you'll want to stick to the cooler side of the palette, warm colors, more fun in the garden. And color also has a cultural component. Um, when you think of the colors of Southeast Asia, the rich, jewel-like deep colors as composed to the, the pale, cool colors of Scandinavia, or even the simple um, fact that men tend to prefer uh, the warm color spectrum of reds and oranges and yellows in a garden, and women tend to be drawn to the blues and pinks and purples, light purples. Um, so these are some things that influence our decisions when it comes to color. There are lots of different color schemes you can use. Um, the one on the far left is a monochromatic scheme. It's not a dull uh, arrangement by any means, just because it's one color. Uh, and by the way, the only true monochromatic uh, plant scheme is green, as, as I keep reminding people, green is also a color. Um, we tend to forget that when we get too immersed in our flowers. Uh, you can use a two-tone. Uh, color, two color scheme, um, opposite sides of the color wheel, blue and yellows. Um, moving along, you can use adjacent colors, reds, yellows, and oranges. Or you can do a mix with a color from the other side of the color wheel as an accent. And if you think what we mean by tone, if you think of the paint strips, swatches that you get at the paint store as they go from light to dark, an easy way to get colors that work together is to go across the same level on two paint strips. Um, so this level and intensity of blue works very well with this intensity of yellow. If you put this yellow in where the marigolds are on the photo on the right, you would have barely notice these pale blue flowers. So why bother planting them? Um, so keeping the tones in an arrangement the same um, is an easy way to get a very compatible and attractive color scheme. The shape of plants is what makes a garden interesting. Flowers come and go, but the shapes are there with us, particularly in the woody plants, they're with us all year. And shapes convey uh, cultural feeling. Um, the very formal style of a sheared yew or boxwood, as opposed to the very loose style of a weeping white pine, most of our woody plants tend to be sort of in between that. When you're choosing plants for a small garden, um, sometimes it just seems very logical to go with um, a plant simply because it's narrow. And so you look at the weeping cypress and you go, well, that's narrow and it's beautiful and it would fit the space. But if your design objective is to have a lot of flowering plants, you have to keep in mind that this is going to eat up a lot of ground space that you might want to use for something else instead. So there are places in a small garden where that might be fine. There are other places where it might just take up too much space, even though it's a very narrow plant. Um, the middle one, a birch, uh, if you love birch trees, but you don't have space and you come across this in a catalog, 
and you think, well, this would be great, but it's got a very aggressive shallow root system. You won't be able to successfully grow anything around it um, because you'll be constantly fighting the roots. And this one also happens to be subject to bronze birch borer. Um, the sweet gum on the right, again, you may come across it and think, well, that's perfect for my very narrow space. Um, but if you're talking about a small garden, you're never going to be able to get far enough away to view that sweet gum unless you're standing half a block away because it has a mature height of 60 feet. So you're just going to be seeing a pole in your garden. So you have to be careful and take into consideration, is this the right plant for my space? Texture is very important in a garden. You always want to um, mix up the textures, whether it's a container or a flower bed or a foundation planting. By texture, normally talk about leaves. Um, medium texture, most plants have medium texture on the left. Um, the median leaves of um, coneflower and behind it, I think that's a peony behind it. And even these um, leaves on the um, iris pallida are considered medium. For a coarse texture, just means it's a big leaf. It doesn't mean that it's unrefined. So the leaves of a hosta, and then they play beautifully against the very fine texture of the sweet woodruff. And you can see on the right, just how texture can lend interest to what would otherwise be um, an ordinary sort of tree and shrub planting. You have to have a sense of style. Um, and what goes into style, um, symmetry and balance are the major thing that defines style. Um, and very symmetrical designs are formal. Um, then you go all the way to the informal side of the spectrum. Um, form and materials you use are elements in the style. Consistency is vital in a small garden and you always want to have some focal points. So when you talk about symmetry and balance, that's what gives the garden a feeling of formal versus informal. Um, the one on the left is very formal. Um, it's perfectly symmetrical. If you drew a line down the center of the garden, the right side and the left side would be identical. Formal gardens have a limited plant palette, a limited color palette, um, and they're not for everyone. But if you're just dealing with a small cart courtyard or a small patio, that may be the way to go particularly if you like things neat and tidy. Uh, if you prefer a more natural approach, the one on the right is a much more informal and it's based on balance. Although there are some elements of symmetry, the path going to and from the circular patio. If you wanted this to be really symmetrical, you'd put a bench on the other side and make the plants all identical. But in this case, the colors are balanced around uh, the planting area, but they're not identical plants, giving it a much more casual and informal look. Um, one of the big small spaces, um, conundrums that uh, most homeowners face is what to do with the side yard. Um, and generally, um, what you're left with is a walk going down the middle of that narrow space. Um, the gate opens in the middle of the fence if you've got that area fenced. And then you're left with two very narrow planting strips. What the heck do you do with them? Um, particularly if you don't want vines growing at the side of your house. Well, unless that's the only access from the front yard to the backyard. 
um, to get your lawnmower through. You may want to consider changing up how you treat that space. Move the gate off to one side, and instead of being a perfectly symmetrical planting bed, you weave it in and out, giving you more spaces here and there for plants, using some irregular paving so you can tuck in even more plants, using narrow, tall plants to emphasize um, a tiny little space. Can you see the Hakone grass here? One of the most charming gardens I was ever into in on a garden tour is um, they had planted Hakone grass on either side of a path and allowed it to spill over and that functioned as the gate. And as you walked on the path, the grass just kind of tickled your ankles as a welcome into the garden. Here's another situation we faced with very often. This is what the builder gives you. Um, maybe two to three feet either side of a walkway. And the tendency is to just go ahead and plant identical shrubs on both sides of the walk. Um, we have this situation all over my subdivision and my neighbors are constantly calling me over um, asking questions about um, what should they do about the shrub on this side. It's just not growing as well as the shrubs on the other side. The ones in the front are looking sunburned. The ones in the back, too shady. Um, and even within this very narrow space, you would think the conditions are the same, but they can be wildly different on either side of the walk. So what you want to do is change things up a little bit um, use some unifying plants, and then on the shadier side, plant a more shade tolerant. On the sunnier side, plant something which is a little more sun tolerant. Uh, in this case, it's a sun-loving clematis. On the other side, there's a matching trellis um, that you can't see with a more shade tolerant clematis. Um, used a slightly more sun tolerant hydrangea on this side. Um, that's the uh, Annabelle wee, wee White. Uh, and on this side, we used a mountain um, hydrangea, which likes a little more sun, uh, a little more shade, and then unified with hellebores, which are planted where they will get the most shade and not just mirror plantings of each other. Now, are there any other questions at this point? Um, yes, Merle, we had a couple questions okay. come in. Um, one was when about the sweet gum, the sweet mm -hmm. gum tree, yeah. the, sli the sli slender, slender silhouette. silhouette. Used, yeah. does, is that one of those trees that, that drops the balls all over the place? Um, those. I'm trying to remember. Um, I have not used that one. I think it may be, but I'm not sure. I know some of the newer cultivars are do not have them, but I would have to check on that one. Okay. Yeah. And then the other question um, that we had is regarding, uh, I think probably a slide you just went off of the trellis about yeah. trellis plants mm -hmm. against the wall. How do we preserve the wall? Okay. Um, well, let's go back here. Um, the trellis should be mounted so that it's um, kind of a few inches off of the wall. You never want to screw it flat to the wall, of course. Um, and I think that's a question of how much maintenance you want to do. Um, if you really are concerned about um, the plantings uh, affecting the wall. I would say you don't want to use a trellis that's attached to the wall. You want to use a freestanding trellis. These trellis are attached to the wall and they're kind of artistic trellis so that in the winter uh, when the vines are not up, um, they um, are a little bit of artwork on the wall. 
in their own right. Um, now I have not seen any discoloration on the paint um, on the walls there uh, from the vines. Um, if you decide you don't want them anymore, obviously you'll have to do a little patching on the wall when you take the bolts out. But um, I really have not seen a problem when I have used wall mounted trellis. But if it is a concern, I would say um, go ahead and use a uh, freestanding trellis. And then maybe you would want to consider a uh, an herbaceous rather than a woody or uh, year round vine so that it's not uh, staining the wall. Does that help? All right, yes. Um, and we did have a comment then put in the sweet in the uh, uh, chat box about yeah. the sweet gum. Yeah. Someone responded, yes, sweet gum balls. Sweet gum balls, yeah. I, I kind of thought I remembered that as being one. Um, only very recently have some come on the market that don't uh, have the balls. Um, and I know those things are a terrible pain. Um, yeah. All right, and that's all the questions um, okay. that we had come into the chat box at this time. Okay. Um, Thank you. Let's see how we're doing on time. Okay. Um, you want to plan for all seasons. Um, it's very easy to follow the trap of things look great in the spring, they look okay in the summer, and then along about July, everything kind of peters out. Um, you can use, um, one of the tricks I like to use is to kind of define a color palette and start in the spring with very light pale colors, and then choose plants that get deeper in tone as the summer progresses. Um, and it kind of tends to match the look of the seasons as you go along. So here we had, uh, and this is Chicago. So yes, this was a rhododendron that doesn't do well here. Um, but a uh, pale pink rhododendron. And when that's out of bloom, um, then the Annabelle hydrangeas are there and they've bloomed white and are turning to a nice greener shade in the late summer. The iris just provides a nice vertical um, accent in the spring garden. Um, and then, you know, the purple fountain grass gives it that vertical look. In the late summer garden, the uh, sedums are going to carry it through the fall. But you see how just a similar color palette of uh, pinks and purples goes to the raspberry pinks, the deep purples, silver foliage accents. And it's a very coordinated look. Hardscape for a small space garden, um, you really do need to pay some attention. Um, if you want to squeeze every bit of planting space into your small space garden, um, then you want to choose a path material that lets you do some interplanting. Um, and if you're a modernist and most people are not when it comes to gardening. Um, this is an interesting look, but it's very monochromatic in terms of the paving. They use the same pavers for the walk, for the path as for the patio, and then use a similar color gravel to fill in uh, around the beds. So it gives it a very unified look. You never want your hardscape to be the major focal point in a garden. You want it to enhance the garden. Um, I'm a big fan of stone in the garden. I think it adds a quality um, of texture and solidity that sets off the plants. Um, I've always been enamored of Asian gardens and they, they focus very much on the use of stone. And if you don't have room for a big boulder, you can always set flagstone on edge um, and it sets off fine textured plants beautifully. But if you're going to plant, uh, to put boulders in your garden, find one you love. Go to the stone yard or the nursery um, and look for a boulder that speaks to you, that has some character to it. Um, don't just set, settle for a potato looking hunk of granite 
Um, look for one that might have some lichens and moss on it, um, which shows it will be hospitable to garden life. Um, this was a very happy accident. Um, I planted the boulder and you should plant your boulders at least a little ways into the ground. Um, and when spring, early spring came March and the carrick sent up its uh, flowers, the color palette was exactly what was reflected in the stone. And then later in the season, uh, the, stone, the boulder comes to life with all of these little seedlings of ferns and mosses that found their way in and are growing on it and adding to um, the look of uh, the garden. Fences don't have to be solid fences. Um, you can put a window in a fence if there's a nice view that you wanna capture. Perhaps your neighbor has a lovely tree or garden that you'd like to peek into. Um, you can incorporate a window into a wooden fence um, to further the view and to give it another feeling of distance and space. Um, you can use trellis type fencing so that um, in the summer um, and throughout the growing season, you can have vines covering the fence, giving you privacy. Um, but when you don't need the privacy and want to bring a little light in to the space, um, the uh, decision with the herbaceous kinds of vines um, let light into that area. Or you don't need a fence, but you'd like some screening. You could do something like this where um, you create a fencing, fenced area that also gives you plants. Trellises, freestanding, don't just go to the big box store and buy a basic trellis if you're trying to create style in the garden. Um, the one on the left is a take on the golden spiral, the golden ratio. Um, the one in the middle um, found someone at an art fair who made trellises. Um, and most of his were in uh, Frank Lloyd Wright style. I asked him if he could do Japanese trellises. He had at a very reasonable price. Uh, he created some wonderful um, Asian style trellis uh, for a garden that was Asian themed. Um, you can find lots of interesting trellis online, uh, which will add an artistic element and be um, a nice feature in the garden, even when there's no plants on it. Um, this would be a good place to stop. If there are any more questions, um, maybe stand up and stretch for a minute if somebody needs to, and then we can talk about plants. I have a couple questions. Um, where in this, in our areas, do we get the good boulders, interesting boulders? Interesting boulders. Um, well, since I'm from Johnson County, um, I'm more familiar with the Johnson County ones. Um, I have gone to suburban uh, landscape. Uh, they have, because that's near where I live, they have some very interesting ones. House of Rocks has some, which may be more up your, towards your neck of the woods. Um, unfortunately, I'm not that familiar with Wyandotte counties. Um, if you do a quick Google search for stone yards, um, maybe, you know, Wyandotte County or Kansas or Kansas City, um, you'll turn up some and then you can check their website and see what they have. Um, but generally, um, the larger, nurse, better nurseries will have some and the st there are some big stone yards around that have some interesting boulders. Okay, and that kind of ties in um, to the next question is on trellises, do you have some suggested links or suggested artists that we can um, look up online? Down here, no. Uh, in terms of artists, um, suggested links. Um, okay. Um, maybe if we take a quick break and I could go uh, back to 
my screen um, while we're on a quick break. I can look some up because uh, I do have a couple that have some interesting trellis. Um, actually, now that I think of it, hay needle is one website that has had some interesting trellises. Um, and there are several that do custom work, but I don't know if you really want to get into uh, custom metalwork trellises. Uh, down here, I don't really favor metalwork trellises all that much, unless you're going to use them in the shade. Um, they can get boiling hot if they're in a full sun location. Um, so um, I will give that some more thought. I can always email some links to you after the talk that you could share with your participants if that works for you. Sounds good. And also then, so how long of a, um, that's, that's the last question I have, um, if that, that I had come in. And uh, so how long do you want to take a break? Would have participants take a five minute break or? That, that'd be great. Okay. Just get up from the chair, stand up, walk around, grab a drink. <laughs> Since we're on Zoom, you can have a cup of coffee and I'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so everyone, um, let's take a five minute break. Sure. It's also one of the last trees to lose its leaves in the fall. And interestingly, it goes a very deep purple in the summer, um, even deeper than the color here. And then um, it turns green in the fall. Um, which is kind of odd, but interesting. Blackhaw viburnum and uh, its cousin, rusty blackhaw viburnum, uh, either one will do well here. I just couldn't find a good picture of a rusty blackhaw viburnum, um, but it's native, uh, does very well here, um, and is a great small tree in the garden. Again, a nice choice um, instead of crab apple or red bud. Tricolor beech, uh, the one on the right, was touted as a great foundation plant, great to put at the corner of your house. But um, early on, a lot of people underestimated the spread of this tree. Uh, it will spread 20 feet. Um, so if you're on a small property, a small lot, it may not be the best corner plant because it may uh, be well at spreading well into your neighbor's yard, but it is a wonderful tree if you have uh, a good spot for it, likes a bit of shade, um, and it has this great color and foliage, which remains through the season. Espaliers are a great way to make use of a very narrow space. Um, this was a neighbor of mine on the left uh, who gave up trying to find anything that would work uh, in the space the builder left. Um, so he put in an espaliered apple. Um, this one happened to be one of those five varieties on one plant and four of the varieties do very well. Um, and one of them gets powdery mildew, one branch gets powdery mildew without fail every season. So that is a drawback if you're getting one of the multi uh, cultivar kinds of apple espaliers. But um, if you grow a single, variety, it may avoid that problem. Um, ginkgos are great for espalier. Um, and this one is kind of a semi-abstract. You don't have to use those very formal European style um, structures when you're doing an espalier. But if you've got someone who loves pruning and trimming, espaliers are a great hobby. Um, and you don't necessarily have to uh, even do a shape. You can, something like a Japanese maple, which has a very full uh, branch structure and small uh, branches. Um, you can just keep it trimmed flat to fit in a very narrow space that you might have. <clears throat> Some shrubs, um, oak leaf hydrangeas. Um, a lot of dwarf oak leaf hydrangeas do very well here. Um, keep in mind that the word dwarf does not necessarily mean small plant. It just means small relative to the species. Um, so a dwarf oak leaf hydrangea, whether it's Sykes dwarf or peewee or ruby slippers is still going to be 
four to five feet high, four to five feet wide, and possibly wider. Um, this one, little honey, comes out bright, bright yellow, retains it, uh, that yellow color in full sun. If it starts to get more shade as the season progresses, it will go more towards the chartreuse. Um, there's a fairly new dwarf Annabelle hydrangea or smooth hydrangea. Invincible wee white um, gets 18 to 24 inches high as opposed to four feet on the um, regular Annabelle hydrangeas. Um, so you have less flopping too because it's a shorter stem. Um, it's a nice one. I happen to love tree peonies and I make an exception to my two week wonder rule uh, when it comes to shrubs because of the tree peonies. Um, they are absolutely stunning in early May when they come into bloom with these eight to 10 inch blossoms. Um, a mature one can have a hundred blossoms on the plant. The neighbors always stop by. Um, after the bloom is through, um, you have a shrub with an interesting shaped leaf. So it works well in a shrub border. Um, some years you get uh, great color on it in the fall, some years not. What is inevitable is it's the world's ugliest shrub in the winter. That's it um, in midwinter and it's not really pretty to look at. So you wanna cite it fairly carefully so that it's not at a very prominent focal point um, in the winter and somewhere where it comes into its own come spring. Korean spice bush is a great spring bloomer um, and does attract some butterflies. Um, compactum is a nice one. It will get four feet high, four to five feet wide. The buddleias, they're breeding them smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, the blue chip series was one. Uh, they, then they went to the blue microchip series. Um, so you can find buddleias that are no more than a foot high by a foot wide. Um, they're probably getting a little small at that point uh, to bother with. Um, there are lots of dwarf ginkgos um, that you can find online. Um, Chi Chi is one that I've grown. And when I first started growing it, um, they said four to five feet high, four feet wide. Um, as people have been growing it, I've noticed the catalog listings have changed. And um, it's one of the issues with new introduction plants after they've been around for a while, start seeing that maybe their growth habit isn't quite what it was claimed to be at first. Um, now they're talking about it may get up to eight feet high uh, in some areas of the country, 10 feet high. Um, so, um, it's one that probably will get a little larger than the catalogs that we're saying it is, but it's still a great plant. Um, can be pruned uh, and kept down in size. Um, so if you like ginkgos and these ginkgo cultivars that are dwarfs are all exclusively male. So you do not have the fruit problem. Standards are a great way to double your space in a garden uh, because it leaves you space to grow underneath. Um, there's um, dappled willow. Um, most of the nurseries here carry it as a shrub. And as a shrub, it's probably a little wide for a small space. Uh, but if you can find it as a standard, uh, it's a great uh, variegated leaf tree. Uh, we have two native plants. Uh, they were sold up until this last year at some of our local nurseries. They seem to have disappeared from the marketplace. but maybe a nursery around your area uh, might have them. You might be able to find them online. Button bush makes a great standard, uh, fun in a more formal garden. Um, nine bark, um, perhaps a, a less formal garden. Dwarf conifers uh, are always good. Um, weeping white pine isn't necessarily a dwarf, but it does generally tend to stay in the 10 to 15 foot high range. Um, so suitable for a small garden and it is fairly slow growing. There's also the columnar white pine, uh, which doesn't get more than 10 feet high. Um, also good in small spaces. Um, there's an umbrella pine. 
Umbrella pines are notoriously slow growing. And this is cultivar on the market, Joe Cozy. Um, actually only gets about two to three feet wide. So if you like an Asian style garden, this might be one to look at. Um, there's a white pine called sea urchin, um, very small cushiony looking uh, pine. So if you want something that has that kind of rounded cushiony look and you don't like trimming boxwoods uh, or yews, um, sea urchin will do very well. Um, there's another white pine. There are dwarf white pines, um, which are in the four to five foot range, um, probably uh, better than mugo pines because they don't get that saw falaya larva on them, which is kind of disgusting to look at. Um, dwarf Norway spruce, which will do okay in our area, um, has this great uh, spring color to it, and the dwarf blue spruce. Vines are great. I want to talk about some that are less used. Uh, the black-eyed Susan vine, an annual vine, small enough to use in a container, maybe six feet high. Um, passion flower, we have a native passion flower, the maypop, which is winter hardy, but it is also an agricultural pest. Um, so if you like passion flower and you're near an agricultural area, you may want to grow the tropical passion fruit instead. Um, bring it in the winter if you've got a place to store it. Um, that's a wonderful vine. Um, one that is seldom used here. Um, it is a tender tropical. Um, most people never see it in the nurseries because if it's in the nursery, it's in that rack of summer bulbs um, that are near the cash register in little bags. Um, you buy it as a root cutting. Um, it looks like a dead cigar, um, but if you pot it up in early spring, um, start it growing indoors and then transplant it when the weather is warm, you get this glorious uh, red trimmed with yellow. It's a very light textured vine, um, really has a wonderful tropical look. Um, two other small vines um, are the purple bell vine and the climbing snapdragon. They're great in hanging baskets, in containers, has small vertical accents in the garden. If you've got the space and you work all day, Moonflower uh, has this wonderful night blooming blossom that attracts moths as pollinators. So you don't have to worry about bees in the garden if you have someone with an allergy. And then of course, there's the classic climbing roses and the rose and clematis combination, which is screams English garden. Um, clematis are a standby, um, dozens and dozens of cultivars, uh, but give some consideration to the small flowered ones. Pitcher clematis is our native clematis. You will probably have to find that online or perhaps a native garden nursery around here. Um, Duchess of Albany is a nice spring flowered uh, clematis vine. Um, again, a small flowered one. And the latest um, one that's getting a lot of attention and is getting widely planted is Raguchi, which flowers from late spring on into fall. Um, small flowers, but hundreds of them at a time. And it's herbaceous, so it dies back in the fall. You cut it back to the ground. No issues about how do I prune? What do I, when do I prune? Just cut it back in the fall. Um, grasses and sedges, <clears throat> excuse me, they're pretty um, widely known and used here, but a couple that are less well known um, that might give some consideration in a small garden, autumn moor grass um, will do okay here, as will pink mooly grass if it's in a sheltered location and it's a nice small grass until the fall when it comes into bloom and it's just eye popping when it blooms. Um, if you've got shade, um, you can still have grasses, Hakone grass or Japanese forest grass. This is the variegated variety. Um, there are all green varieties. There's an all gold variety. Um, they do love shade. Um, they have this wonderful cascading look. If you grow it in more sun, um, it will cascade 
more all the way around. It tends to look like cousin it then, uh, but is a wonderful grass um, and stays up well into the fall. And the dried foliage is attractive. Um, there's a lot, dozens of carrots you could use, but banana boat has this bright screaming yellow variegation, uh, which really brightens up a shady spot. And ground covers tie everything together. Um, here's some that are less well known, less often used. Mukdinia, which has this wonderful um, variegated edging and a great leaf shape. Um, some of the Chinese gingers have great variegation. Um, um, going back to our natives, um, not used nearly enough in my opinion. Um, nice spring bloom, little white uh, spikes of flowers or pink. Um, Tiarellas are either clumpers or trailers. Um, Jeepers Creepers is obviously a trailer. Uh, Crow Feather has a um, semi-trailing habit. Um, so they both will spread and work as ground covers. Um, and Crow Feather does have wonderful fall color. Um, when all else fails and you have nowhere else to grow, grow up. Um, this was a great uh, planting that I came across online. I take no credit for this, but it turns an otherwise harsh landscape into something that really catches the eye, gives you an opportunity to grow where nothing would grow before. Um, the new wall mounted uh, planters and grow bags have become quite popular. Um, you can find some that have a built-in reservoir, um, which is probably better. Um, to do because you can take them off and fill the reservoir rather than watering on the wall, which tends to muddy things up. Um, there's this style of grow bag, which to me looks like shoe bags. Um, so I wouldn't use these in a display type setting, but they would be great if you've got an herb garden or a vegetable garden or a potager. Um, and then um, these new plastic pouches, which you can use to hang on a fence. Um, the one drawback is until they really fill in, you are seeing a lot of plastic. And then one should always accessorize. Um, so how do you bring art into a small space? Um, you do it by going back to those thoughts about texture and visual perception. Um, this was a great planting because of the streaks on these glass sculptures were picked up by the oops, stripe the vertical veining on the ground cover and the kind of um, narrow vertical lines of the background planting. In this one, the sense of joy and reaching up for the sky echoed in the plants, um, reaching up in the same way. Um, and here, the texture on the sculpture is matched by the texture on the stand and the texture around the pond and even the fine texture in the background. So give some thought when you're placing your art as to how the art can enhance the plants and vice versa. So remember scale is critical in a small garden. You don't want a lot of visual clutter in a small garden. You have focal points that direct the eye. Don't create an illusion of space. Always mix the size of your plants. Um, you always want some plants that you can look in the eye. Um, design your landscape looking out from your windows as well as looking uh, through the garden uh, because that's where you're gonna be viewing your garden a lot of times is from your window. And remember to plan for all seasons. There's always a place to grow something if you just look, okay. Do we have any other, any more questions? Yeah, we had some questions coming okay. to the, uh, the chat box. Okay. And is the clementis on the fence at the veg, uh, oh, that's for our attendees. Do, uh, do the kinds of containers on the wall require watering about every hour in our Kansas summers? Oh yeah, uh, that's why I said uh, I would go with um, 
something that has a reservoir, if you're talking about those kind of picture frame ones that are very popular, the plastic mm -hmm. bag types that were hanging on the fence, they will probably, particularly if they're on a west facing fence, require watering twice a day. You're gonna have to check them. Um, some people love to water. I'm a very Darwinian gardener. I plant, I'll water when I remember and you're on your own. <laughs> so, okay. That's kind of the gardener I am. Okay, and then um, we had a comment that someone said, I had, I have had the long bags with impatience and begonias in them and had to water daily. Mm -hmm. saying. Yeah, you do have to water them frequently. They don't have a lot of soil um, capacity. Um, you would probably want to use a soil retaining mix in them, um, give you a little edge on it, um, as opposed to just a regular. A soil retaining mix. I use the word soil and I never use the word soil when it comes to containers because um, you always want to use a mix, a soilless mix. And there are those that have moisture retaining additives. Um, so they work much better for those kinds of container plantings. Um, okay. And then um, the last question I see is pink regarding the pink mooly grass. Yes. You said it needs a sheltered location. What mm. do you mean by sheltered? Um, you... you don't want it. Um, a microclimate where it's warm, because it is marginally hardy in our climate. Um, so if we have a really severe or a late frost, it might do it in. Um, so a warm sheltered spot, but it does like sun. Uh, so you might want to put it next to a wall that would retain some heat. Um, I have seen it grown up in Chicago, which is zone five, um, but it was in a sheltered spot. Um, so um, when we say sheltered, you know, it kind of depends on the plant, but in this case, out of a lot of wind and maybe in a slightly warmer microclimate spot in your garden. Okay, and that's all the questions and comments that I see come in through the group, uh, through the chat box. Okay. Well, I rambled a little long. Merle, this is Kim. Hi, Kim. It was It was not too long. It was a lot of good information. And on behalf of our organization, I want to thank you for sticking with our plans and giving us this wonderful presentation. You're quite welcome. You know, we had to make a few changes with Zoom and all, but I think oh, we it, all do. <laughs> it came across and worked very well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.